Before I go with what's on the screen, I'd like to welcome, thank everyone on behalf of Session for as a heartfelt gratitude for your generous donation towards the White Gift Program over the Christmas holiday. Your kindness and generosity made a great difference in the lives of many people in need. Part of that included several boxes of items which were gratefully accepted by Inner City Ministries and the Ottawa Mission. And thank you very much to Jean and Stuart Elder, Beth Huber, Alsa, and Jim McPhee for helping to sort and deliver the boxes. Gifts of money and vouchers, food vouchers were distributed to over 25 individuals and families in our community to help them with their celebration of Christmas. Recipients expressed much appreciation to the Parkwood family for the assistance during the Christmas season. So thank you again for your donations and your support. We hope to continue with this program this year. May God's grace and peace 
be with you always. There are a number of bar- Bible studies that are listed here. The first one is the Barkwood, the Barhaven Bible study. Uh, it's the book of John that's being studied. Please contact John Fair about that. Second one is the Sterling Park Afternoon Bible Study. That's uh, Claire McPhee that you can contact. Then there's a youth group this week. Parkwood will meet at church on Friday, 12th of January, 7 to 9 p.m. Please contact uh, Vicki Henry about that. Finally, there's Lunch and Learn. And please join anyone who wants to come on Monday, the 22nd of January. That's the first one this year at noon in the fellowship hall for the first lunch and learn of the new year. And if you want to sign up for that, please contact Betty Paul. Now, the annual general meeting of Parkwood is going to be held on February the 24th. This is the first notice at 6.30 p.m. And all members and adherents are encouraged to attend. Um, For those who are submitting Reports, the deadline is the 26th of uh, January and Friday. But if you have reports early, please send them in um, as JPEG files. And the name of the team and the group in the, in the file name. Submit all those to the church office. If anyone is interested in volunteering to help with the assembling of printed copies of this year's report, please contact the church office. We propose to print the, um, the, the annual report by 9th of January, but that could change depending on how much help we get, I guess. Anyway, you could contact Elizabeth maybe if you have any further questions. Then there's the interactive adult uh, service advance notice for those aged 16 to 25 would like to welcome you to join them on Sunday the 28th at 7 p.m. They will be studying and continuing the conversation on fruits of the Spirit. And please invite friends to come. There will be music and refreshments. Now the most important notice perhaps, because it's coming up soon, is the first aid course. This is the Red Cross Standard First Aid and CPR course. Uh, planned for the 6th of April and the 20th of April, 9 to 4 p.m., so it's two full days, basically. What's important is that people interested in taking the course must register by and pay for this course by January the 28th to confirm your spot. It should, it should be noted that the certification is for three years, uh, and the instructor is Paul, Paula Whaley of the National Capital First Stage course. The course requires 11 to 16 participants, so hopefully we can meet that number. Otherwise, the course probably won't happen. Other details are in the insert in your bulletin. So now I'd like to welcome you on this first day of winter again. We had one and then it sort of vanished for a few weeks. And now we're back into it. And who knows how long this one will last. So please prepare your hearts and minds for worship. These are the announcements. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. The seventh is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Jesus said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. They asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one whom he has sent. Let us worship God, and as we begin, let us sing for the fruits of all creation.
Now let us pray. We come, O oh God, seeking refuge. But we come in hope, we come with joy, we come because it is your voice that calls us. And though we come from many different places and situations, we come to a God who knows us and understands us and is able to come and express to us that understanding and more than that a deep very deep love a love which has been proven by parting with your own son for a time that we might in him have forgiveness and life. Gracious God, this day, the first Lord's Day of the New Year, may it be that each of us who have gathered in this sanctuary and each of us who has connected online from our homes know you are among us. And more than among us, by the power of your Spirit dwelling within us, bring us to faith, strengthen our faith, cause us to stand in the knowledge that we live in you the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We confess, O oh God, that left to ourselves, life is not satisfactory. In fact, far worse, it is plagued by sin. It is plagued by selfishness. It is plagued by animosity and strife between one and another. All around us, we see all too evidently the fruits of lives lived for themselves, of work done in vain. You have come, O oh God, to reclaim us, to restore us, and to enable us to live as you have designed us to live, in anticipation of the abundant life that is eternal. May we taste of that. May we experience it in part. And may you fit us for eternity. On this day of rest, May you challenge us to take up the work of this year to the praise of your name. We ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, this morning, I suspect that there are many boys and girls either playing in the snow or sleeping in. But I'm glad to see a couple here. And all I want to do this morning, by way of address to the young and the young at heart, is to ask this question. What work are you going to do in this new year? I want you to think about that question because that question is one that God asks of all of us.
And to help us find the answer to that question, what work will you do? Jesus told a whole bunch of stories. One of them is going to occupy us this morning for a little bit, a little later. But all I want to say about it right now is that God takes the initiative. God starts off the idea and assigns us our work. And then at the end of the day, after we've done the work that God asks of us, he surprises us. He surprises us not by paying us what we think we should be paid, but he surprises us by giving us more than we can ever imagine and discovering how God appoints our work and how God enables our work and how God rewards our work. It's one of the great secrets, one of the great joys of life. So, ask yourself this question. What does God want me to do? And be prepared for God to surprise you. Let's pray. Dear God, we give you thanks this morning that you have something for us to do. Help us to hear you and to respond to you when you call us to work for you. When we have, with your help, done what you ask us, surprise us. Surprise us with the gifts that you have for us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. And we pray that we might understand each day of the year to come, how he works for us and how you invite us to work with him to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our praise is entitled, Make Me a Servant. We are blessed to bring gifts that God has first showered upon us to him in service. Our tithes and offerings for those who are here may be left in the plate at the back. 
for those who are at home may be sent online or delivered either in person or by post to the church. Jesus, strong and kind, inspires our giving. The choir will sing to God's praise as we bring and contemplate the gifts that we bring. Let us pray. Gracious God, we bring gifts, gifts of love, gifts of work, gifts that are tangible expressions of the generous bounty that you have shared with us. And we pray that as we offer our gifts to you, you may be pleased to receive and bless them, that others may receive good news shared in action and in words by your church here in this city, across this land, and indeed all around the world. May the partnerships that we have with believers in Jesus Christ bear much fruit as lives are challenged and changed and blessed through the witness of your church in the days of the year to come. We ask this to the praise of your name.
Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we continue with prayers of thanksgiving, intercession, supplication, are there any requests anyone would like to voice or reasons to give thanks that you would like to share? Yes, Dale. We are grateful that your life and the lives of those who live with you are healthy and safe in spite of great upheaval. Yes, Keith. Anyone else? Yes. Cool. We want to pray for the situation in Nigeria, which continues to be quite not at peace. Anyone else? Let's join in prayer. Gracious God, we come this morning conscious things which weigh upon our hearts, uh, challenge our minds, and indeed disturb the society in which we seek to live. We would begin this morning by giving thanks for those who maintain public safety in the midst of storms. Pray that they might be given safety and strength and encouragement in the work that they do. Not just here in this city, but indeed, O oh God, around the world, we recognize that there are many who are displaced by flood or fire or earthquake tsunami, or other disasters that seem to be beyond understanding. When will God, one or other of us, experience loss, disruption in our lives, we are grateful that we can turn to you and find reason to give thanks for mercy and trust that you will see us through. We lift up our brother Dale and those who have been dwelling with him in the loss of their residence by fire. And we pray, O oh God, that you would receive all our gratitude for preserving life and limb we pray that those things needful for the future, for shelter and warmth, accompanying provisions for life, would be abundantly multiplied, especially to those who must find a new place to dwell. We remember those who are working in the shelters in our city. Pray that they might have the resources they need, the patience and forbearance to deal with those who are in distress. We remember health care workers, some among us who work in the hospital or in the clinic, and those who perform surgeries, and those who assist them. We pray that in whatever conditions they are called to work, you would strengthen them. We give thanks with Jean for Crystal's surgery during the night, 
and those who were available to act for her. We pray that your hand of healing would rest upon her. And indeed, we lift up, O oh God, in the quiet of this place in our hearts, the names of those we know who are facing illness or treatment or surgery and who need your help. Tender and strong touch of the great physician. Hear us on their behalf as we come in the name of Jesus, the great physician, for them. Gracious God, we also come this day for those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for those who find their lives displaced, or distressed, or infiltrated. We pray for Christians who are seeking to live in peace in Nigeria. We pray for those who are torn apart from their families in Gaza, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and Iraq, and for all homes upon which death, injury, pain, and displacement come. Oh God, you have come in your Son to make peace. Peace in human hearts that leads to peace in lives. We pray that you would enable the power of the Prince of Peace to be recognized, welcomed. We ask, O oh God, that you would restrain the hand of the evil those who have the levers of power and authority within their grasp cause them to exercise those with restraint and with mercy. Gracious God, may the abundance of your grace sustain and bless each of us, and enable us to share that grace abundantly with others. We ask it all in Jesus' name, who taught his own disciples to pray, and invites us in the same words and in the same spirit to lift our hearts to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Diane is reading this morning, am I correct? Please come and read for us the scriptures from the book of Isaiah and the book of Matthew. morning. The Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. Chapter two. The mountain of the Lord. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, 
The mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge the nations between He will judge between the nations and will settle many disputes, disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The next section is the day of the Lord. You have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions from the east. They practice divination like the Philistines and clasp their hands with pagans. Their land is full of silver and gold. There is no end to their treasures. Their land is full of horses. There is no end to their chariots. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. So man will be brought low and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Go into the rocks, hide in the ground from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of men brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel. The arrogance of man will be brought low and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day and the idols will totally disappear. Now the New Testament lesson is found in Matthew uh, chapter 2. Uh, no, chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Matthew. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them in to his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, 
Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came <coughs> and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. <coughs> Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. May God bless to our understanding these readings of his own holy word. Amen. Thank you, Diane. As we come to reflect upon the scriptures, we're going to sing All Who Love and Serve Your City. Many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning. 
hiring people to work in his vineyard. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. And before we take a close look at this parable, I need to say a couple of things by way of introduction. First of all, we're going to return to our series of reflections on stories that Jesus told, which occupied us in the fall, and is going to occupy us, God willing, through the winter. Because the stories that Jesus told are compelling stories. They are stories that help us to have windows of insight into the very heart of God and into our lives. It is important that we always understand the reason that story is told. And Although the titles and the chapter divisions in our modern English translations of the Bible are there to help us, they are not original. The original text of Scripture in both Old and New Testaments, by the inspiration of God's Spirit, reveal to us in God's order and in God's time and in God's purpose, his word to us. And it is important always to understand, to interpret, to apply the scriptures in the context in which they are first given, in order that we might not be led astray by our own imagination. And so I want to point out that at the very beginning, the parable of the workers in the vineyard is sandwiched between a word of purpose and a word of purpose that is reiterated at the end. If you look at the very last verse of Matthew chapter 19, it says... Jesus is speaking, many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And then he says, four. And that introduces the illustration of this story. And at the end of the story, which ends with the question, or are you envious because I'm generous? He repeats the same word that introduced the story. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And in actual fact, it reverses that. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now, the only conclusion I can draw, which I think is valid, is that Jesus is wanting, with the story in between, to make a very important point. And that is a point that needs our close attention. Do not think, says the Apostle James, more highly of yourselves than you ought, but think of yourselves soberly. We need the mind of Christ. We need the Spirit of the Lord to help us understand ourselves. Because the world wants us to think of ourselves 
in ways that we should not think of ourselves. Just keep that in mind and we'll come back to it at the very end. The other thing I want to do by way of introduction is to say that in our current climate, in the climate of the world in which you and I live here in the year 2024, we are in exponentially fast ways moving from the design of the world that God first instituted. And we are in danger, therefore, of misunderstanding and misapplying the lessons that Jesus and the Spirit of God draw from the design of the world in which, as God first intended it. Now, what I want to say may make more sense if we use a contemporary illustration. On our television screens in recent days, we have been mesmerized by pictures of someone winning a dream home. And the implication, though not stated, is that our society holds up at the top those who win the lottery. Those who, by chance, get the prize. And I need to say as forcefully as I can, that attitude is completely at odds with the ethic of work with which God designed the world. We desperately need a healthy work ethic in our society. We continue to see glorified those who slack, those who are able to avoid work, who get by with the minimal amount done. And what we're doing in that process is to lead people's expectations in a direction that is at diametrically opposite ends of what God designed. If we go back to the book of Genesis, we learn that God designed Adam and Eve and appointed for them the work of tending the world that he created for them to enjoy. Work was a God-given God-appointed task. Not something initially that was designed to punish or prevent people from enjoying life. No, work was intended to be the means by which we embrace life. And even after Adam and Eve messed up and did what they weren't supposed to do, in Genesis chapter 3, God made it plain that they would work. And yes, work would bring sweat and toil, 
but work was still to be redeemed by being the means by which life was cared for. The life of the vineyard, the life of the garden, the life of the field, the life that is given in every seed-bearing plant entrusted to mankind for food. There is a connection between our being able to eat and live and our doing the work God asks us to do. So much so that in the New Testament, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul reiterates the point, if one will not work, one will not eat. He upbraids those who, among the Christian community, had put their faith and trust in Jesus and were waiting for his return. And some of them had become very idle, sitting around, doing nothing, living as parasites off of others while they waited for Jesus to come and lift them up. Paul had to remind them, this is not the ethic. This is not the way of life God intended. Now, against that background, I simply point out that a healthy ethic of work is implicit in the story that Jesus tells here in Matthew 20 about the owner of the vineyard who goes out to work that vineyard and is conscious that he needs help to work the vineyard and he is prepared to employ people to work the vineyard. And I want to suggest that the story of work and its results illustrates the kingdom of God. It comes out of a context in which there is a healthy ethic of work, and it is only in that context that we are confronted with a total surprise at the outcome. Because the parable is intended to turn upside down the logical consequences to the human mind of what that ethic produces. Those who work the hardest get paid the best. And that's where the ethic goes off the rails. Because in the beginning, God said, six days shall you labor and do all your work. The seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you will not work. And when Jesus came, as we said in our call to worship, the question that he sought to answer, what is the work God requires? It is to believe in the one whom he has sent. Now, I want to get into the story for just a moment. And I want to point out that this particular parable of the workers in the vineyard illustrates fair work for fair wages. Fair wages for fair work. The householder goes to the marketplace and he says, I want to hire you to work and I'll pay you a day's wage. The denarius was the amount common, commonly understood as a fair wage for a fair work. So he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day as he hired them in the morning and sent them out to work. Now, second thing I want to point out is that that did not guarantee that everybody found employment. Because the third hour, which would have been nine o'clock in the morning, 
the day was divided into 12 hours, beginning at 6 in the morning and ending at 6 in the evening. At the third hour, the same householder or vineyard owner goes back to the marketplace where people gather and finds that there are others who are looking for work. He says, ah, you go work too, and I'll see that you get paid. What's right? Again, the sixth hour, noon, our time. And the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, he goes out and he finds still others gathered round what we euphemistically now would call the manpower office, the unemployment center, looking for work. And he hires them. And then at five o'clock in the afternoon, an hour before the normal quitting time, he goes back again and finds still others standing around. And he says, well, what are you doing? He says, no one has hired us. Well, I'll hire you. Now's your time. Now's your turn. Unemployment among those who are willing to work is not a new problem. We like to think it is. It's as old as mankind. The other principle that is here is prompt payment for work done is God's ethic. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers, pay them their wages. The law of Moses said, you don't hold back the wages of a working person overnight, but you pay them at the end of the day. Beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first, again illustrating what Jesus is going to do in upending the world's way of thinking, he says, pay them their wages. The workers who were hired the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. And so the day's work was rewarded with the day's wage. Even though they hadn't begun the same time as others, they answered the call. They took up the offer of work. And those who had begun find themselves looking, wondering, well, if those that worked only an hour got paid a full day's wage, maybe, of course, he'll pay us more. But Jesus comes to upend that model. The kingdom of God is not based on an industrial model from a fallen world that measures one against another. No, here's the surprise, the first surprise. Everybody was paid a day's wage. I will give you whatever is right, he says. Now notice our fallen world. Greed, that is, a desire for more, gives way to grumbling. Murmur, mumble, mutter, grumble. That's the spirit of 
the word that underlies this. They began to grumble against the landowner. And those who were hired last worked only one hour. And that was in the cool part of the day, after the sun had descended from its height. And those of us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day, why are we treated equally? It's unfair. But the answer of the owner of the vineyard is, first of all, gracious. Friend, he says. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't come at them with all the barrels of the gun blazing. He says, friend, I'm not being unfair. You agreed to work for a day's wage, and I'm giving you the day's wage, just as I promised. But don't I have the right to do whatever I want with my resources? Or are you envious because I'm generous? What should be our response to generosity? Well, it certainly shouldn't be envy. And we should not envy the one who gets the prize, arguably undeserved. But if one is generous, the intent is to bring blessing. And the blessing is not just to the one who receives more than might otherwise be expected. But the blessing, if rightly grasped, is intended for everyone. Now, all this parable is to illustrate Those who are first may, in fact, not be first. And those who are last may, in fact, not be last. The takeaways from this parable are that God calls all to work. God extends an invitation to everyone to enter into the blessing of his reign, his kingdom, revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And as God calls all, he gives grace to all who heed that call. All service is recognized and rewarded. But as God does that, he wants to issue a warning and the warning is, those who think themselves to be more deserving may well find that they are less so. And those who think themselves undeserving or less deserving may find themselves to be surprised by the grace that says, yes, you matter. And yes, you are honored. And yes, you are blessed. My prayer as we 
reflect upon this is that all of us will be thankful. Thankful for work to do. Thankful for the call of God that says, come and serve me. And with whatever gift God has given, let us invest in his service, in his kingdom. And let all of the work that we offer be an expression of gratitude for the privilege of using our gifts to the glory of God. If we have truly received God's grace in the forgiveness of our sins, in the empowerment of our lives to live for him, may we give ourselves gratefully to him. And may the seeds of envy be banished from our midst. May the curse of grumbling disappear from our midst. Jesus surprises those who think they're first in line and best qualified to receive his blessing. And he surprises those who think they're last in line and undeserving. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Kingdom of God. Let us pray. We bless you, O oh God, that Jesus came to give us life and to help us understand the gift of life, life as you've designed it, life as you've redeemed it in and through him. That the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the greatest owner of the universe should exchange the glory and comfort of heaven For lowly life, born among the animals, lived without a house or home to call his own. And to lay down that life, unjustly taken for crimes that he did not commit. And all because he loved. For you loved, O oh God, the world so much. You loved us so much. You loved me so much. You gave your Son that I might have everlasting life, abundant life. May the life you give me to live May the lives that you give all of us to live here and now in the days to come be lives lived in gratitude to you. May we offer our skills, our gifts, our talents. May we offer our time and our treasure and our resources. May we offer ourselves. Not looking at our neighbor. But looking unto Jesus who gave his life, that we might live. May we give our lives in return, O oh God, in gratitude. And may the kingdom of God flourish among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing praise this morning. Lord of the living harvest,
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of God the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.